All right, well, I think we're going to get started. We are here talking with co-executive director of the Philly Orchard Project, Kim Jordan, and Christina Moresi of the Wissahickon Environmental Center about a joint project the two organizations put on planting a food forest in the Wissahickon Valley Park up at the Wissahickon Environmental Center in the Andorra Natural Area. So welcome, Kim. Thank you, Christina, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And Kim, I'm going to let you take over a little bit and talk about Philly Orchard Project and what's been going on, and then we'll circle back to this specific project in the Wissahickon. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I am presenting my background photo, if you can see it, is from one of our many food forests across the city. It's uh, St. Bernard Garden and Food Forest in West Philadelphia. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to get to talk about our work. Um, so I'm a co-executive director of the Philadelphia Orchard Project. I serve alongside uh, Phil Forsyth, who's been the director of POP since day one, pretty much. Um, and so, yeah, just gonna introduce our organization and um, we'll start out with just the mission, vision and all of that. Um, so we, are a nonprofit that plants and supports community orchards in the city of Philadelphia. And I've tried to include a lot of different um, pictures throughout the presentation. Um, it's, you know, we really care about uh, growing food, but we also care about all the people that are involved. So, you know, showing, showing some of the different sites, the, the different volunteers um, and the different things that can grow in the city is what I'm hoping to get across today. Um, so we work with community groups across the city and um, usually with existing community organizations. We uh, talk with them and work very intentionally with them to work together to create urban ecosystems that are green spaces that connect neighbors, provide hands-on learning experiences and grow fresh fruit for generations. And we are doing this again in partnership and in collaboration with community organizations. We're never just showing up somewhere to say, Hey, this is a cool lot. Let's put an orchard here. Kim, um, do you do you find that people uh, or organizations come to you, or are you kind of seeking out areas? Do you have an interest and then find a, an organization that might already be on the ground? Um, we've generally had people coming to us, um, and I think that's why we sort of have. Um, I'll show a map on another slide of where the the sites are. So we sort of have clusters of sites. Um, again, we so we were founded with. Um, in 2007 with this realization that Philadelphia has, you know, I, th I think that number is probably a little bit lower now, but a lot of vacant lots and high levels of poverty and food insecurity. Um, and we could have uh, a, another full presentation about the many reasons for that. Um, we don't have time to get into that, but so what we, where we do, what we focus on is um, planting these spaces in um, primarily low wealth neighborhoods where people have limited access to fresh fruit. Um, there aren't as many grocery stores. Um, there aren't as many green spaces. So we really are trying to improve all of those things with our community partners. Um, and um, so we have not sort of looked where are we not right now. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're a small organization. We don't really have the capacity to do a lot of like uh, ramping up our plantings a lot. And we're generally getting pretty regular requests um, so just to, um, briefly like go over our core values, um, which is on our website, phillyorchards.org. Um, but we, you know, we really believe in, um, the power of education and it's not on the slide. I just decided to add it, um, <laughs> education and lifelong learning. Um, we really care about justice. Um, so environmental justice, food justice, and that's why we focus on these, um, neighborhoods. Um, we care about Permanence. So this is, you know, uh, trees can take a, a while to produce. They might take five or 10 years before they're really growing um, a productive um, harvest. So it's important that we are intending to be there for the long term with in partnership with these communities. Um, we care about regeneration. So it's not just sort of sustainability and keeping things where they are, but actually making things better. Um, so that's why some of the things that we do also include include improving the soil, planting pollinator gardens, really thinking about the whole ecosystem. Um, and then the last one is beauty because we think everyone should be able to have access to beautiful green spaces too. Um, so since POP was founded in 2007, we've planted 
um, 50 orchards. Um, we also work with an additional 15 sites that we didn't originally plant, places like Saul High School, Mill Creek Farm that have existing agriculture programs and efforts. Um, overall, these sites have a total of close to 1,500 fruit and nut trees, 3,400 shrubs and vines, and um, close to 24,000 perennials. And there's a ton of different things that we plant. There's a full list of that on our website too. So you can see all the, the variety of things that we plant. Um, last year, you know, a strange year for everyone, but we still managed to work with some volunteers, um, had people participating in um, activities in orchards, whether or not we were there, um, educational programs, just got using outdoor gathering space was really important um, and that will continue to be important. We planted three new orchards last year, um, slash food forests, Wissahickon Environmental Center being one of those. And um, we held 145 orchard events and educational events. So wow. mostly this was uh, orchard care days um, where we, our, our, our staff went and worked usually with a small team of community partners, maybe some volunteers if they were allowed. Uh, we so, do seasonal uh, visits to all of our partners, um, helping them with ongoing orchard care. Do you have volunteers uh, with your organization or is it mostly volunteers coming from your partner community group? Um, it's, a, it's a mix. We have a lot of people on our email list and we had a lot of people asking if they could volunteer, but sure. um, for the most part, what we had last year was we had a, like a smaller core group of um, a new terminology for us, lead orchard volunteer. So people that um, were committed to one specific site and they were mm -hmm. working closely with POP staff and site partners on um, the ongoing maintenance and care. And where we had the plantings, there was there were the there was the opportunity to bring in a you know a few more folks. Again, everyone was being very conscientious about keeping group size limited. Right. So we often had to do um, multiple planting days to get everything done. Whereas in the past we could have you know 25 or 30 people do it all in one morning. Um, but this this was sort of like we'll do as much as we can and then we'll come back until we finish it. <laughs> do you have a favorite tree that you plant? Um, yeah, I really love service berries. Um, also called June berries, shad berries. They have a, a ton of different names, um, but I love them because they offer something in every season. Maybe not as much in the winter, but in the spring they have beautiful flowers. Uh, they offer uh, delicious berries for for people and birds <laughs> and other critters. <laughs> and then their um, their fall color is really um, beautiful as well. Excellent. Yeah, um, and they're planted all over the city, including by through the city's like tree planting efforts and the city, you know, is helping grow the food, food forest canopy too. Um, so POP's main projects and programs, really our core program is the orchard planting program. Um, so we, again, work with existing community organizations to plan, plant and expand orchards. Um, so this means starting at community outreach and engagement, you know, is there really a want, a desire in this neighborhood to see an orchard? Uh, they talk about, you know, we talk about how is the space currently used, how do you envision it being used, and, and what are the types of plants that you want to see growing here. And then the expansions, we often will do um, multiple plantings over a series of, of seasons or even years with different groups, um, whether that means replacing things that aren't working out um, or just simply expanding the size of, of the, the orchard. We do a lot of education um, in a range of different ways. So we do um, a lot of hands-on training. We do, um, we're offering our ecological orchard care workshop series, Popcore, for the first time online next month. Um, well, and is there open, are there open week. spots? I feel like people are, are really excited spots. about that. There, there are, are open spots. Excellent. And um, like with everything we do from our orchard plantings to our workshops and other events, everything's on a sliding scale. So it's really a self-assessed sliding scale if you, if you can pay, pay. If you can't pay, sign up because we still want you to learn. Um, we publish a lot of materials on our blog and our resource page. So you can search um, a variety of different topics or just sort of see what's there. In a normal year, we like to do um, our gleaning program and our sort of community um, skill sharing program um, sort of combined with pop harvest. We do group gleaning efforts like with June berries. Um, or we just let people know where the trees are and then they can go pick on their own. Um, and then we do a, a workshops as well with outside community educators that have specific um, 
cultural, culinary, medicinal, or historical knowledge to share about a plant. And we host them, provide materials, and, and all that stuff. Um, and then lastly, the big thing we're working on now is uh, the Pop Learning Orchard at the Woodlands. So this is going to be the first site that Pop itself actually oversees. And it's going to be a demonstration site for people to come and learn. We've planted most of the orchard so far. It's, a, it's on about 1.2 acres. We moved our nursery there and we're going to be adding in um, high tunnels to extend the growing season and again provide more ed educational opportunities and um, a greenhouse in in the future. Wow. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, but you know beyond that we work um, again in an ongoing way all, all over the city. So the next slide will show the map of where our partner sites are located. Um, and the green ones are the ones that we like originally planted the red dots Hopefully no one's red, green, colorblind. I just realized that might be an issue. Um, the red dots are the, the supported sites um, that we didn't originally plant, but they are with a variety of partners, including like with the Wissahickon Food Forest on city owned land at parks, recreation centers, historic houses. We work with urban farms and gardens like uh, Grumblethorpe, Bartram's Garden. We work with um, houses of worship, uh, Union Baptist Church, Monumental Baptist Church, some other sites. We work with schools. Um, that's been a little difficult the past year because they've yeah. mostly been closed. Um, some housing agencies, hospitals, um, other environmental education centers as well, and a variety of community organizations. So it's a really, really wide variety of sites. And if you go on our website, you can get a little bit more detail about which sites are open to the public um, and just a little bit of sort of snapshot of each site. Um, so for the specific site, the food forest at the WEC Treehouse, um, this is sort of how the process goes for if you're interested in, you know, your community organizations like, oh, this sounds great. We would like to plant a food forest. Um, so we have a process, again, available on our website. Um, you can see sort of the steps to go through. And so the first step is going through the community partner application process. So part of that is, um, you know, POP is committed to providing all of our resources um, regard, you know, regardless of ability to pay. So the first thing we want to see is, you know, do we need to fundraise to possibly right. support this, um, this site? And if so, what is, who's the intended audience? Um, how is the food going to get distributed? Um, and then we look at things like, you know, is there, what's the land access situation? Is there water access year round? who is really going to be committed to the long-term care of this site. Um, so if it's just sort of like one person with a, a vacant lot, you know, that's not really great because if they don't own the lot and there's no one else there, the lot could get built on, they could move. Um, so we, we look at these things. Um, our team, our, our staff of six. Um, make <laughs> six? Did they you don't all six? go. You have a staff of six. Go. We have six people. Um, that was a huge map. Yeah. Of, of uh, work. So amazing. <laughs> um, amazing. So there's, there's sort of those visits, um, consulting visits to do site assessment, to have some of those initial like organizing meetings with um, neighbors to talk about, you know, what do they envision for the site? And then um, the, the, the design is created, reviewed. Um, and so, you know, it takes a little while to go through these steps. And, and then in the spring, so specifically for the food forest at WEC, um, most of the trees were planted. Um, we installed the tree stakes and the gator bags, a ton of mulch. Um, I can't remember if, if uh, we we're going to see a picture of the, the giant pile yeah. of mulch, but um, generally sure we, see the mulch. we, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe we generally we start out with planting uh, with, we do the tree planting in the spring and then we'll add berries, perennials, ground covers in the fall. Um, that just uh, gives them a better chance to establish. Um, and then in, for this site in particular, we had to worry about the deer because um, a lot of the trees they find are tasty. So to protect the, the trees, we, um, we at the Wissahickon Environmental Center with the help of uh, Parks and Recreation installed uh, deer fencing. So that was a pretty critical thing. Um, well, you will get to see photos, but right now I'm just gonna show a design map. So don't okay. worry about all the little letters, but this was just to sort of show um, you know, what the orchard design looks like. Um, each of the, like, the letters stands for whatever tree is going to be planted there. 
and it's supposed to indicate that what the size of the mature um, tree or berry bush or whatever will be. So you understand like how the space will will be look like, you know, in years. So you don't want to you don't want to plant things too close together so that they can't, um, you know, get enough lit, light and air. So for this design, um, in talking with the folks at at the Wissahickon Environmental Center, um, they it was, you know, decided that there, there, you know, besides the food forest, there was going to be a pollinator garden, a culinary garden, the mud pit, which I hear is a very popular um, activity for kids that take part in the after school programs. Um, and then I don't know what the Northeast section is, but it was on the map. So um, again, I'm not going to read the whole list, um, but okay. there's a variety of different fruit and nut trees, uh, shrubs and vines and perennials and ground covers. And so we like to plant um, a variety at each site. You know, a pop community orchard is not gonna be like a Lynn Villa orchards or any of the sort of you pick places that have a row, you know, rows and rows and rows of the same tree. Um, that just doesn't make sense in a city. So we like to, to have a variety. So I just have a couple pictures of some of the things that we like to plant. Um, so on the left uh, is my favorite, the Juneberry. Um, and that was, I think that was actually a tree on a block near my house in um, Fishtown slash Kensington. So you can see the row house in the background. Um, but yeah, those are beautiful and um, they are all over the city and we actually have a map on our website um, and we'll publicize it again when they start getting ripe of where people have identified trees that are in uh, publicly accessible places. Um, we like to plant sort of more unusual fruits like gooseberries, um, they're delicious. They're a really good um, educational opportunity. And also the less common fruits tend to have fewer pest and disease problems. Um, crab apples, which is on the right, is uh, another thing that is, you know, we don't necessarily plant them, but this was from a gleaning or harvest um, mm -hmm. event a couple of years ago. There's a bunch of these trees on the Penn campus and they actually um, have invited us there and given us a map of where all the trees are because then they don't have to worry about cleaning up as much fruit that falls down. So crab apples, you know, you can't really eat them right off the tree, but you can make applesauce or cider. stuff like okay, that. I was just going to ask you, what do you do with all those crab apples after you collect them? And, and is that something you guys do? Do you make the applesauce or do you donate it to someone um, else? To we've done it? both. So we've donated it to Sunday suppers, um, which is a uh, like a family meal like healthy food like i don't know how to i didn't look up how to describe them but um to various programs that do like meal meal prep stuff um and then also some partners of ours did a workshop where they made um apple crab apple butter so that mm. was one of the pop harvest ed workshops where people went out to pick crab apples together and then the next day met at a, at a restaurant that was letting us use the space to do this workshop and everyone made crab, crab apple butter together Excellent. Um, and then, you know, besides the, the fruit trees, the nut trees, the berry bushes and vines, we like to do um, a lot of ground covers, perennials that um, either have edible or medicinal properties. Um, so this is some anise, anise hyssop, some yarrow and some bee balm. Um, so they either have their own properties, like they are fixing nitrogen, they attract pollinators, uh, but that really like helps complete the whole ecosystem. Um, and so that's the sort of whirlwind introduction to the Philadelphia <laughs> Orchard Project. Um, we would love for people to get involved. You can go on our website to sign up for our email list. You can follow us on social media at Philly Orchards. Um, and we are gonna have an open house at the Woodlands on May 22nd time TBD, um, open house and plant sale. And those are some of our um, couple staff members and a few of our lead orchard volunteers that helped get the Woodlands Orchard planted last year. Excellent. Everybody loves a plant sale, so make sure you yep. share more details with us. And we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to make sure of... we have enough plants. Uh, yes, on hand. make sure you have enough plants first, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll get you swarmed over with people. <laughs> um, I think we also have Christina Moresi from Wissahickon Environmental Center standing by. I feel like I'm like leading from a newsroom here, and I'm going to go over to Christina in the field uh, out there at WEC. Sunny day, nice change from the, the snow, I'm sure, although it must be still yeah. chilly. And uh, we'd love to hear, of course, the Friends of the West Hagen loves WEC and has been a longtime partner uh, with the building and the, the property. Uh, but we'd love to hear what kind of was the inspiration that led you to uh, bring the, the uh, food forest to WEC and, and your vision for the future there. Um, so we have this 
kind of plot of land that seemed to me to be very underutilized. It was sunny, but it wasn't a meadow. Um, there were already bees here. And we did put our mud pit here for mud day, which is wonderful. So the more I kept looking at it over the years, I, and having worked um, with Pop Orchard when I was at uh, the Wick Historic House Garden and Farm, and um, just knowing of them and taking classes, that it just seemed like the perfect spot to have an orchard. Um, with that, we also, it was probably came to thought too around um, apple festival time or apple pressing. Yeah. So during that time, you know, we have to buy apples and we teach about fruits and, and um, cidering, but we never had our own stuff. Um, we also do lessons on um, like wild edibles, spring tonics, um, and all of these things that, you know, a lot of it can be foraged here, but um, once the idea of the food forest came on, we realized that we can just expand everything that we already do and more in this spot that is completely underutilized anyway. Excellent. So you did all this during the pandemic. Was that a challenge or did it make it a little easier with less traffic up at the site? Um, there was actually a, a lot more people here during the pandemic. <laughs> more people, yes. Yeah, it, it, so that part was challenging, but the fact that we weren't allowed to have programming and then we didn't have summer camp, um, I think it really helped us out physically and mentally to have this focus, um, to be able to do this and grow this and build it, you know, while we didn't have our kids or didn't have that busy of a summer. And how's it been holding up so far through the winter? Um, it's snug in the uh, in the snow. Let me see if I can yeah. change my camera. I don't know how to do that. So, oh, there you go. All right, so you guys can see. It's just snug. I'll the bees in. are actually out today. It's it's. It's actually really warm in the sun, but the bees are buzzing. So both of our hives, um, Northwestern Stables mm -hmm. and the Treehouse have hives that, um, honeybee hives. So we were kind of worried that they weren't going to make it through the winter, but they're, uh, they're out buzzing now. Great. And has the deer uh, fencing held up? Have you had any problems with deer brows? I, I think a few folks watching have that question. No, it's funny because when it was just the trees before the fencing, you could tell that the deer were like recognizing it as like prime real estate. <laughs> Somewhere in here that its hole is here. And I'm like, it probably understands like what its, what its surroundings are. As soon as the fence went up, you could see it though. And especially now in the snow, the tracks, the scat, all on the edge of it. So they can't get in, there's nothing they can do. Everything is holding up, but I can, you know, you can tell they're checking it out. Maybe having that like little Jurassic Park moment where they're just checking the fence for weaknesses for a while. <laughs> well, hopefully Tommy Cat is scaring them all away. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so what is any expansion, any more planting that's gonna happen this spring or what's the vision uh, in the short term? Um, I think we're just at maintenance now. So we've got our our understory and our herbaceous layers um, in the fall. And then, so we needed the fence to be able to protect them. So we didn't get the fence to the fall. So then we were able to put those two layers in um, and everything just got tucked right in and hopefully established before it got too cold. But so right now, I mean, we're just going to maintain it. We have the pruning day coming up. And it's just watering. Watering's a, an adventure here because we don't have water access. So we have to string uh, multiple 100 foot hoses together. And um, we were filling the bags. It takes about five hours to fill the gator bags. So we're going to figure out how to uh, make that easier, I guess. Let me see if we can get the tank over there. Maybe we can get mm -hmm. the tank filled and. Yeah, I mean, we have we have a lot of struggles with uh, our gator was stolen. So 
so the gator was stolen that was a nice was, gator i know um so that that's been another challenge the amount of sheet mulching we have to do um now we're just wheelbarrowing and shoveling um so it's been tricky but it's it's just one of those things that make you have to be creative think of different ways to do things we have to sugar differently now um so it's a little adventure wow that's uh that's keeping you in shape all that physical work uh it is trish and i always compare our steps for the day <laughs> who wins trish always does yeah <laughs> good um, is there anything else you'd like to share with folks or um, upcoming events that everyone should know about? Uh, on our Eventbrite page is our upcoming events. We're hoping to have our full noon hike on Friday, depending on the trail conditions. And we have a Kids Explore offline, I think March 26th, when the kids have off. And all of that's on Eventbrite that you can sign up. And I think it's just keeping, kind of just keeping in touch through social, social media and on Eventbrite to see um, how we're doing. The city kind of stops, stops us and lets us go at different times. So we have to kind of just roll with it. Right. Well, you know, it may not have felt like it the past month, but I'm sure spring is coming and with it, all of, all of our wonderful visitors to the Wissahickon. So they'll be thrilled to to see the food forest and uh, hopefully that deer fence will keep uh, the deer and, and everyone from trampling uh, in there. Um, I think if we have any questions, I, I'm looking in the chat, we talked about deer. Um, I'm sure on POP's website, if folks are interested in supporting the organization or programs, I feel certain that there's a way to do that on their website. Uh, we at Friends of the Wissahickon always have uh, programs listings for our partners at WEC. And uh, certainly if anyone wants to help us buy WEC a new gator, we could we could certainly uh, make that happen with money. Uh, let's see, any questions? Nope, Kim's sharing the donate page here. I everyone. thought I was getting a prompt to do that. So. Check it out. Yeah, no, that, you were, excellent. Yeah, it's a little Pick hard. It like, thrown down there. You know, normally, right. normally we have so many um, opportunities for people to volunteer throughout the year because we do, you know, we do, uh, we do uh, uh, work days at a lot of partner sites, but just, you know, this past year, we've had to keep those numbers down, our partners have had to keep those numbers down, and there just haven't been that many um, volunteer opportunities. So hopefully, they'll, that'll start to open up a little bit more this year. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll always post them on our website when they're available. Um, Excellent. I know we're all excited here in, in the Wissahickon to see uh, wonderful photos of kids picking mm -hmm. fruits and nuts from the, the food forest here and, and have that education expanded. So we're really um, so grateful to Pop for helping uh, design and organize that and for Christina and WEC to uh, have had the great idea to bring that to, to the Environmental Center and, and the park. So. Uh, thank you both for so much uh, great work and for this fun talk and we'll hope to see you soon and uh, have all these projects thriving. Thank you. We're excited. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you everyone for attending our very first Creekside chat. I feel certain we're going to have another one in March. Uh, it's on our events calendar and I believe that we will be talking with the Philly Tree Project uh, in March. So uh, tune in then. And until then, have a great day. Bye. Bye.